Welcome back, Left Reckoners. David here. Um, just me this week. Matt is still busy, um, deeply involved in important matters of state. Um, but I'm very stoked to be joined by yet another Matt, um, this one, uh, Matthew E. Stanley, um, who is a professor of history at the University of Arkansas. And we're going to be talking a little bit about Reconstruction. Um, but Matt, thank you so much um, for joining us on Left Reckoning. Uh, thanks for having me, David. Happy to be the uh, substitute, Matt, for today. <laughs> That's good. I like it. Um, well, I mean, like, uh, you know, there's so much in this uh, um, period, and I feel like this might have to be part one of maybe a few more converse- conversations in the future. But, you know, Reconstruction is, I think, a really, really critical period in American history. And it's one that has a lot of lessons um, for the left today. And also just if you want to understand sort of the history of this country, the institutions that we have, the political makeup of, of, of this nation. Um, but I was just curious, you know, just sort of top line, I know it's a broad question, but you know, if you could give somebody, you know, your pitches to why, like today, if you're a left wing or if you're somebody who wants to see some significant changes in this um, society, uh, why reconstruction might be a period of time that's worth studying and understanding. Uh, well, I think that's the case because it's it's the most striking example of, of revolution uh, or lev- revolutionary activity uh, in U.S. history. And, and in that sense, it's the most striking example of sort of political possibility, um, even in, in, in world history in, in, in the 19th century in some ways, because we're talking about um, the emancipation of you know, ultimately over four million people. Um, we're talking about uh, the transition of enslaved people into soldiers and to citizens and to office holders, uh, all within a sort of short time span. Uh, so we have, you know, voting, office holding citizens. Um, so, you know, we're talking about the largest liquidation of assets, uh, private property assets, one of them uh, in world history, certainly of the 19th century. Um, and so uh, the Reconstruction era, you know, constituted uh, what historians have often called a, a second American revolution that was um, far more revolutionary than the first revolution in terms of um, sort of, um, un, you know, uh, un disrupting the, the sort of social order. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that's you know, the, the big pitch. And there are sort of a lot of different uh, sort of sub lessons within that, I think, that are useful to uh, temporary left. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is such a fa- fascinating time because, you know, <laughs> I don't think it's wrong to look um, at that period and, and see like a lot of hope for maybe, you know, a different, um, you know, course of like, for example, like the 20th century um, and, uh, you know, also something that is sort of lost um, in a way. And like, you know, I mean, if you could just um, give folks a sense, I know, again, this is like a general uh, question, but, you know, like what was the process of reconstruction, particularly, um, you know, for the way that like governments and democracy was sort of, you um, set up for people who were living in these formerly Confederate uh, states? Yeah. um, Well, Reconstruction was the first sort of large scale uh, experiment in interracial democracy in world history. Um, You know, it wasn't um, a a neat, uh, uh, seamless, uh, uninterrupted timeline. Uh, Mm -hmm. So it sort of ebbs and flows and different pivot moments. Um, It's normally broken down into... Uh, sort of uh, um, a first um, sort of uh, um, phase called presidential reconstruction in which the executive branch of Governor Andrew Johnson at this time, of course, unelected um, uh, conservative racial reactionary um, was sort of calling the shots, including rolling back uh, uh, the early promise of land redistribution in 1865 and 66. Um, uh, And the sort of a second phase called radical reconstruction um, in which uh, the radical wing of the Republican Party sort of gained ascendancy in uh, between 1868 and uh, maybe the late 1860s, 1870, um, and sort of had a, a larger hand, though not um, a sole hand, in determining the course of events. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, and the thing is, even, even when people talk about what Reconstruction is, I mean, it's, um, it's like there's a contested periodization there. I mean, some people, you know, talk about Reconstruction as beginning with the first self-emancipating uh, people during the course during the war. Um, you know, does it begin with um, you know, this federal policies, confiscation acts, things like that, the creation of the Freedmen's Bureau uh, or Appomattox? And, you know, there's some uh, debate as to when it actually ends, too. Um, is it when southern states are redeemed by former Confederates um, through violence and intimidation and coercion? 
uh, is the, the, the decline of the radical wing of the Republican Party, the withdrawal of federal troops from the South. Um, but um, but yeah, we're talking about um, a, a, a basically a first civil rights movement um, when African Americans achieved and embraced these sort of basic rights of citizenship, voting, marrying, sitting on juries, uh, things as basic as traveling and freedom of worship. Um, and it was capped by uh, a reconfiguration of the U.S. Constitution through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which Eric Foner, is, his recent book uh, labeled a second founding um, mm -hmm. that was, you know, just as crucial and, and, and elemental to uh, the way that the relationship between um, the central state and citizens as, as, as the Bill of Rights or as uh, certainly as any other uh, political document in American history. Um, but yeah, but all this time, uh, freed people, particularly ex-slaves in the rural South, are dreaming of even bigger visions uh, uh, than what is being uh, afforded to them through the central state. So things like land redistribution, um, the, the idea of 40 acres and a mule, um, which is still sort of part of the sort of cultural currency of um, of the memory of Reconstruction, uh, free homes, old age pensions, reparations for slavery. Uh, so um, they're, they're thinking really beyond capitalist markets and beyond capitalist notions of private property um, into uh, a more what we would think of today as sort of a social democratic vision of the post-war South. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is, is such like an exceptional time period. And like, um, I'm curious, um, you know, to, to hear your description, for example, of like, um, you know, the the black political movement in this country, because like it really is such a unique um, moment, like not just in American history and like global history to go from being enslaved, uh, you know, to being like a, a player on the political scene, um, you know, in, in, in the way that they were in this, in this period of reconstruction. I mean, could you talk about in the South sort of like the, the political organizations and like the aspirations and ideas um, from people who, you know, had recently been, um, you know, lifted out of out of bondage? Um, and also, I'm just curious, um, you know, you know, this is a big area that we're talking about here, too. Like, you know, are there certain parts of the South where like those movements were stronger than others or areas where maybe they were weaker than others? Yeah, um, just in, in a general sense, um, there are, um, you know, I guess the most sort of radical or revolutionary um, features uh, of the period come out of um, mostly the Deep South and mostly in areas that have um, higher populations of, of African Americans. So we're talking about the, the last states, you know, to be uh, redeemed, as, as, as it was called at the time, which is a euphemism for um, former Confederates sort of retaking political control. Um, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, South Carolina in particular, those three where the black population is, is you know, rep represents about 50 percent of the total population. Um, uh, you have um, a number of revolutionary features, things like, um, you know, black activist organizations like the union leagues, um, uh, political conventions, equal rights conventions, all kinds of sort of political activity uh, that begins to percolate um, by the time that the war ends, uh, not to mention uh, new uh, interracial state legislature, legislatures. Um, that are elected in 1867 and after uh, because African-American men are allowed to vote for the first time in the, in the South. Um, so you have the existence of interracial parliaments, um, uh, a lot of black labor activity, um, mm -hmm. not through formal trade unions per se uh, necessarily, but um, things like strikes and sort of spontaneous demonstrations from you know, Nashville and Memphis to New Orleans as a major site of black, black labor activity. Um, in which um, freed people have um, the power to sort of um, negotiate uh, in a way that they had, of course, never had uh, under, under slavery. Um, not to say that they were devoid of agency, but agency as, as a worker took different forms under enslavement. Um, but you have, you know, attempts to, to really, uh, by uh, organized uh, former slaves and, and a number of, of white allies, um, you know, I don't want to discount the, the role of interracialism in the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the radical coalition, um, you know, in, in any given deep southern state, maybe 10 to 15 percent of, of white men, uh, including a number of former Confederates, would support uh, the Republican Party. Um, 
it offered a lot of things to poor white people, you know, mm -hmm. schools for the first time, uh, education, infrastructure, just basic things, um, you know, in, in, in some ways trying to bring uh, uh, the American South into the 19th century, into the, uh, uh, into the, in, um, in terms of public provisions and things like that. Um, so you have an attempt to sort of completely transform the old social structure and its customs. Um, and include and that included, you know, not only sort of basic uh, public provisions, but it also included sort of a cultural war on the vestiges of slavery in the old South. So in South Carolina, for instance, there's, you know, there are laws proposed to ban uh, the N word, um, and, and things like that. So this is a, a very broad based, um, sort of, uh, I guess, sort of, uh, organic, uh, revolutionary activity, uh, among former slaves and, and, and their, you know, limited number of white allies. I mean, um, this is all sort of happening in the context of, you know, a South that is very much like economically devastated yeah. after the war. Um, and, um, I'm a bit less interested in like the fates of former slave owners um, uh, there, but I'm curious about like, you know, how do you find that this experience of, you know, real economic devastation in that region of, of, of the country, this, you know, uh, new might be the wrong word, but this like rising, you know, political class in the sense of like, you know, free blacks there, like, what's the role of like, you know, economics and, and, and labor in this early period of reconstruction for both, um, you know, blacks and for poor working class whites? Yeah, well, you know, the vast majority of, of former slaves, uh, freed people, and especially in the Deep South, especially in the rural South, um, land is just as critical or more critical of a component of a demand uh, than voting, um, than anything else, than schools, uh, you know, those things kind of all to go, to, to go together and they're sort of mutually reinforcing. Um, that's what they want. They want plantations to be broken up into um, uh, livable, uh, sustainable um, uh, segments. And of course, this is a matter of uh, basic justice. Um, in their minds, they felt, understandably, that you know we're the ones who have cleared the land. We're the ones who have uh, taken uh, the land and and converted it into something that can that has created you know the wealth of the society. Uh, and it's only a matter of justice that people who, uh, you know, um, uh, who had declared war on the United States and who had uh, forfeited uh, the right uh, to that property um, divided up among the people who made the property valuable in the first place. Um, former planters, uh, on the other hand, want to recreate as much of the slave system as is legally possible. Mm -hmm. There's an acknowledgement that slavery is dead. Um, by and large, in 1865, the, the, the white uh, ruling class of the South, the planter class, the planter uh, oligarchy, if you will, um, is pretty much prostrate on that particular issue. Um, but at the same time, they are not willing to concede uh, social rights or equality uh, to former slaves. So their idea is, yes, slavery as we knew it uh, is over. That's the consequence of losing the war. Um, but um, the idea is to recreate as much of the slave system as is politically possible, as is, as is, you know, I want to say legally possible, but they go way beyond the law in trying to do that. Um, but yeah, to recreate the status quo antebellum. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this, in the way that, that, that Southern elites, um, white Southern elites, Democrats end up sort of um, um, rolling back this revolutionary tide um, is by combining sort of successful appeals, not only to race prejudice, but also to property interests. Um, and we see that, you know, um, time and again throughout American history. Um, but eventually, uh, and, you know, these, there, there is um, increased taxation um, mm -hmm. in these new state legislatures in the South, because they're paying for things that um, had never existed before in the, in the South prior to the Civil War, like schools and certain types of infrastructure. Um, and so when white small farmers begin to feel um, the pinch of added taxation, um, Southern Democratic rulers are you know, uh, saying things like, you know, uh, your tax dollars are going to educate Negroes and things like this. So they're sort of combining race prejudice with property interest. And that proves uh, in the long term, along with a lot of other factors like, you know, naked violence and aggression, the Klan, 
um, and also different sort of iterations of the Klan. It proves uh, a successful, um, as well as, you know, political changes in the North um, and the sort of conservative turn within the Republican Party. It proves a successful pattern for overturning these governments um, and enacting a, 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 a phase uh, that varies state by state, but is, you know, sort of generally known as redemption mm -hmm. uh, or the, the overturning uh, through violence and uh, and other means of, of these state governments. Well, how would you ca categorize that, that sort of like, you know, white, um, ruling class in, in the South at the time? Because, um, you know, from, from my understanding, like, while you do have like this, you know, regaining of power from some of the former like planter families, you also have new kind of like industrial interests, right? Like people who involved in the railroad and like there's a bonanza in the South, right? Of being able to come in and sort of make a, make a, a fortune. I mean, yeah. would it be, would it, um, would it be right? Or, or would, I mean, is it correct to sort of think about those more industrial interests that are coming in as extensions of the planter class or as a new class that sort of fuses with them or as a class that's in uh, competition with them? Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, it's a little bit of all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and this is why, um, you know, the radical coalition doesn't, um, um, doesn't sustain itself in, in many ways, because it is the sort of fusion of um, Southern, you know, a, a deep Southern radical agrarians, which is to say, uh, formerly enslaved people on the one hand, um, and industrial and financial interests within the Republican Party. On the other hand, um, it's not the radical coalition is not a class coalition. Mm -hmm. um, so its class interests are pulling it in contradictory directions uh, in many ways, um, which is why, you know, in the North, the Republican Party begins to shed its progressivism as, you know, radicals like Thaddeus Stevens die uh, or, you know, people like Benjamin Wade are um, ousted from office. Um, there is a conservative turn uh, by the late 1860s, certainly into the early 19, 1870s um, within the Republican Party. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> this is basically what you might think of as a, uh, it takes a while, a simple way to look at it might be is it takes a while for the ruling classes to sort of regroup uh, mm -hmm. after the Civil War. And what um, this regrouping looks like in sort of cultural, financial, commercial terms um, is, is, is a process known as sectional reconciliation or sometimes called blue-gray reunion or blue-gray reconciliation. What it really is, is a slow realignment of class forces, um, the industrial uh, interests of, of the New South, um, sort of uh, meeting the industrial and financial interests of the North. Um, you know, some, uh, some wealthy planners are sort of outside of that sphere. Mm -hmm. um, and they, there is a, a more reactionary sort of bourbon democratic element in, in, the, in the New South. Uh, but there are also sort of more, uh, quote, quote, unquote, progressive minded um, businessmen and industrialists who are looking to sort of re-stitch uh, the wounds of the war um, in order to do what Americans uh, or these type of Americans, you know, uh, do best. And which is uh, to make money and to find, uh, you know, to seek out uh, and uh, retain cheap labor. Um, so, yeah, um, you have um, essentially this coalition. Um, which is an agrarian radical and sort of liberal bourgeois coalition uh, torn between um, its commitments to racial equality on the one hand, and then growing fears of worker and agrarian radicalism on the other hand, particularly after, um, you know, uh, they see things like the Paris Commune, right, in 1871, mm -hmm. um, the uh, financial panic of 1873. So all these sort of pivot moments in which um, this, co this coalition begins to um, uh, f uh, f fall apart. Um, and the question becomes like, how do you lead a sustained revolution um, as even a bourgeois revolution as the party of finance and industry? And the answer to that, of course, is you don't, um, the coalition doesn't sustain itself. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, I mean, like, Labor movement might be an early term, right? Um, for like workers in the in the South at the, at this time, but like you know the, the role in like reconstruction of um, you know building these kind of cross racial um, but class based um, you know um, movements. I mean, you know, how much real potential do you think that there was for that? 
at at that time, right? Was that something that you know it was too early in the, the development of like the the southern economy um, to basically have like a strong working class movement that maybe could have been able to maintain power? Or um, I'm, I'm curious what you think. Yeah, I mean that's a great question. I mean, was was it industrial enough to have uh, a sort of a, a, a proletarian movement? I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. I mean, there there had been, of course numerous sort of loose associations of, of trade unions and working men's uh, organizations and things of that nature prior to the Civil War, um, which were largely wiped out uh, with a financial panic. And a pa panic, you know, for those who don't know, is just sort of a, uh, a 19th century euphemism. Today, we would call it a depression, right, or, or an economic recession. Um, but the, uh, the labor movement um, begins to uh, uh, resurge again, uh, surge again during during the war because of the um, leverage that workers have right during the wartime economy. Uh, and so, coming out of the war, you have the formation of the National Labor Union, the NLU, um, which technically welcomes black members. In reality, they're barred from you know a lot of locals. Um, its leader, William Silvis, um, opposes slavery. He's a, you know an opponent of slavery. Uh, and he absolutely recognizes the practical need to win black workers to the labor program. I mean, he war over and over again, he repeatedly warns um, white workers that, you know, hey, if you if you don't, if we don't include black workers, they're they're just going to be competitors. Um, and so there is this sort of practical self-interest here. Um, the problem is that the white labor movement, by and large, and part of this is is a result of having real class differences and real uh, material and ideological differences from Republican leadership in the North who are often, mm -hmm. you know, caught up in finance and industry is that they are uh, roundly opposed to the reconstruction program, um, which is not going to sell itself to freed people in the South. Um, so Silvis, um, you know, um, uh, rather than speaking to issues that sort of freed people prioritize, which is sort of land and political liberties and equal protection, um, uh, or viewing black laborers as sort of a uniquely oppressed segment of the working class. Um, Silvis and the NLU basically just vilify Reconstruction. Um, Silvis's position on, 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 on Reconstruction and then sort of the mainstream position on uh, NLU position on Reconstruction is that um, very little, it's, you know, a very little difference between Silvis's and Andrew Johnson's, which is to say they support a speedy state-driven uh, Reconstruction. And so there's this sort of yawning gap between the expectations of free people in the South, which is a sort of social democratic state supported um, small D democratic movement um, and white Northern workers um, under the NLU and even the sort of adva more advanced um, parts of the, the, the Northern working class who, who don't see that as a priority and, and, and worse yet, um, you know, see it as something that is, um, rather than something that is is would be you know equal a gain for for all workers, uh, they see it as something that they're being deprived of, that they're the victims to somehow of radical reconstruction. Yeah, I mean it's um, yeah, the, the, I mean the the political makeup there is like I, I think that like it's it's very clear that to sort of avoid what ends up happening in the South, that you like really need a significant amount of state investment to basically prevent the same kinds of people or the same kind of class from just being able to dominate, yeah. um, you know, the South for the next hundred plus years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, land is, is, is the key issue here. That's, mm -hmm. that's sort of the pivotal thing. Um, and uh, there's sort of maybe kind of sort of this, this moment in 1865 where land redistribution was was on the table, mm -hmm. um, and in a way that um, would do two things effectively: it would, um, you know, permanently weaken uh, the power of the planter class. So you would undermine the old uh, social, political, economic order of the old South, which is, you know, from the perspective of Thaddeus Stevens and other radicals, is precisely the point. Um, the other thing it would do is it would provide. Um, free people with a, an economic foundation that would render them less vulnerable within the market. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, um, you know, uh, probably, I mean, the vast majority of white Southerners and, and, a, and a fair chunk of white Northerners um, believe that emancipate, the only result of emancipation should sort of be nothing but freedom, um, which is, of course, to say the freedom to 
um, starve, uh, the freedom to be homeless, um, the freedom to um, attempt to uh, subsist in a highly exploitative, violent um, economic environment under deeply, deeply oppressive uh, uh, contractual and labor arrangements. Um, normally working back on the same plantation that you worked on um, as a slave. Yeah. Um, so this is this becomes sort of you know the compromise between these two visions I spoke of earlier, um, which is the one on the one van, uh, on the one hand the free people's vision of uh, social democratic land redistribution. On the other hand, uh, the planters' former Confederate uh, vision of uh, a new type of slavery by another name, uh, and the sort of compromise of this that we end up with is of course sharecropping, mm -hmm. um, which is um, becomes the sort of dominant mode of economics and production and, and, and a cultural system as well that persists well into the middle of the 20th century. Could you talk a little bit about like the, the leadership class and within like the, the black community um, and sort of, you know, what their makeup was at, at this time, like who was able to sort of get into these positions of, of influence in the you know immediate years of a uh, reconstruction? Uh, yeah. Um, well, they're, they're, it's, it's varied. And, you know, this is, this is a, I think a problem with, with a lot of sort of the popular histories of, of reconstruction or the popular tellings of reconstruction is that they, they blot out not only regional distinctions within, mm -hmm. um, the black, um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, political class, intelligentsia, um, political leadership, whatever you want to call it. Um, but they also obscure class and interracial distinctions, um, among African Americans too, uh, which is to say that um, black, urban, biracial, and freeborn leaders um, in places like you know New Orleans uh, uh, or, or um, particularly more urban areas um, tended to skew uh, petty bourgeois. Um, mm. uh, many of its members were steeped in sort of an individualistic capitalist ideology, which was, of course, by no means unique to them. Um, it was a, a reflection of their sort of class position. Um, but former slaves constituted not only um, a race, but uh, I would argue a distinct and especially radical social class. Mm -hmm. So the best histories of Reconstruction really, um, um, they acknowledge and, and really uh, explore uh, the interracial uh, class distinctions within uh, black communities in the South, because it's not monolithic at all. Um, and they're fighting for different things. There is, as early as 1867, 68, very much a self-help, respectability politics, sort of conservative mm. um, message coming out of um, particularly freeborn biracial black leaders in the South um, contra that contrasts pretty starkly with some of these more radical social democratic demands um, you know, when you think about things like land redistribution or really even into the 1890s when um, freed people are still um, uh, organizing for what we would think of today as basically reparations for slavery, um, th that it is members of the sort of black middle class that are saying, you know, shut up. That's 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 an unrealistic vision um, and that's not going to get us anywhere. Um, so, um, yeah, to, which is to say the answer to your question that as a class, um, uh, as, um, or in terms of their political demands, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're quite varied. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, I'm curious too, cause th this might sort of get us closer to today. Um, but you know, could you talk about some, uh, um, you know, these, these legal constitutional fights that are also happening at this time, um, you know, between, um, you know, things are happening with the U.S. Constitution, um, the way that we sort of in, engage in, in national politics, because you see like Reconstruction sort of invoked a lot today as, you know, we are having fights about voting rights on a, on a national level. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how those sort of played out at the time? Uh, well, um, yeah, and I don't I don't mean to downplay um, voting as a, as a major demand. Um, and. Uh, of course, that I think is the big tie-in, right, to Reconstruction, particularly into sort of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party today or, mm -hmm. or liberals today. Um, you know, you even hear the, the term thrown around a lot, um, you know, a, um, a, what is it, a third Reconstruction, the idea that the Civil Rights Movement was a second Reconstruction. Um, and voting rights uh, were, were obviously a major part of that. One of the things that union leagues and and other uh, black activist organizations in the South are doing is they're, they're, they're registering voters. 
Um, they are um, uh, engaged in what we would basically think of today as get out the vote campaigns. Um, and this is not, uh, you know, this isn't like the low stakes of TikTok. This is the kind of thing where you go around and you register voters and you might end up lynched mm -hmm. um, or, you know, someone, you know, we might never see you again. So I don't want to downplay uh, that. Um, but I think that the, the thing that gets lost in sort of the, the liberal uh, fixation on voting um, is, is to me, the, the, the overriding lesson of Reconstruction. And that's sort of the insufficiency of bourgeois democracy. Um, that there is no substitute for collective, direct, uh, walk off the job action, um, and that voting is was literally designed in some ways to temper um, those kinds of impulses. Um, you know, you, you, the old expression "you can't vote your way to liberation." Like it doesn't hurt, I guess, sometimes, but um, it, I think there's a there's a danger in fetishizing that um, at the expense of a different type of economic radicalism that was just as important uh, and in many cases more important um, to um, freed people in the South who, you know, who had very little connection to some of the, the sort of integrationist political demands. The main thing they wanted was land because they understood it as a matter of justice. They understood it as they're really the only thing that could protect their political rights, that the political rights could be, you know, sort of, uh, stripped away through violence or through, you know, the whims of the next legislature. Uh, and of course that, that proved to be the case. I mean, the, the parallels again are, I think are, are, are very clear just in the sense of, um, you know, where we draw this kind of hard line in, Amer in like American politics right here, like there's democracy here. And then like in, on the level of the economy, on the level of property, right. like that's out right. of bounds. Right. Right. Um, and in the case of reconstruction, you know, as you've been alluding to, it's just like, there's just no way to get around to the fact that you have to be talking about some level of, if at the very least redistrib redistribution, at the very least some kind of like you know federal programs, um, you know to be to be cultivating um, people's ability to sort of get by after generations of of, of being enslaved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean. Uh, in the, I mean, we've been getting at this, and I think we we might need to just do this again, especially when when Matt can get on. But like, you know, I'd, I'd be curious. Um, you know, you've alluded to it a little bit, but like, um, you know, in, in addition to what you were just saying, I mean, like, the way that like Reconstruction, I feel like, you know, and I'm a little younger, so like, has been taught in a few different ways, right? I think there was a kind of pro, a, like more historical one, which is that like Reconstruction was a big mistake, right? Right, um, right, right. And that was very dominant in American hi history classes for a long time. Um, how would you sort of describe and how do you how, how do you feel about the kind of popular understanding the way that Reconstruction is sort of talked about or, or discussed today in the U.S.? Well, it's 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 wonderful that people are even talking about it um, because the, the you know the sort of lead in uh, to to talking about Reconstruction in class. Um, of course, I wasn't I wasn't taught anything about Reconstruction until I got to college. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't really encounter it uh, in in middle school or high school, um, and I so I didn't even have like a negative view of it. I didn't even sort of internalize the the, the sort of stereotypes. I mean, we know, and these the thing is, these are. These are very persistent, right? Because I mean, you know, think about even like Hillary Clinton in 2016 um, talked about Reconstruction in a way that was just sort of straight out of Jim Crow. I mean, she had sort of opined that that had Lincoln lived, there wouldn't have been this dark, you know, ugly stage of American history. I mean, it was just sort of straight out of the Lost Cause, straight out of uh, the Dunning School. Then you know, um, that's uh, that's what she learned. I mean, that was the, you know, that was, that was what she learned in a textbook sometime in the 1950s or 60s. Um, but, um, you know, the, the question is, I, th I think, you know, why is Reconstruction forgotten? Um, because we, we, you know, it's, I, I feel like it's, it's, you know, Americans love the Civil War. Um, <laughs> I mean, clearly, um, they're really invested in the Civil War in terms of, you know, you know culture or tourism or mm -hmm. um, parks or anything else. Hell, weddings. Oh yeah, <laughs> like the oh, worst way. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, a, sort of a, a shocking statistic that speaks to this point is like there are. I mean, it depends on how you classify it. Somewhere in the neighborhood of three thousand Civil War monuments um, mm -hmm. in in the U.S., there are nine monuments to Reconstruction in the U.S. Wow. And a couple yeah. of those, I mean, and then some of those are from the the Jim Crow era. They're monuments to Reconstruction commemorating 
the redemption, the redeemer, mm -hmm. commemorating the overturning of the reconstruction government. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think that the, the old sort of historiography uh, on this is, has died a, a very slow and, and thankful death. Um, the, the Dunning school, the sort of openly white supremacist version of events in which basically the Klan were the good guys. Mm -hmm. um, uh, African-Americans weren't ready for freedom or political rights. Um, Reconstruction was a mistake. You know, there was this emphasis on the harm done not to former slaves, but to, to, to white planners, that this is sort of mm -hmm. white grievance politics. Um, and of course, the Jim Crow, all of this is to say this is an ideological justification for Jim Crow, because the natural idea out of, you know, if you, if you say that, you know, Reconstruction was wrong, that interracial democracy was wrong, then Jim Crow is sort of the necessary corrective uh, to this. Um, and what we've pivoted to today, it, you know, and I think in, I'm speaking in a general sense here, mm -hmm. um, is sort of um, comes out of the uh, kind of the neo-abolitionist school of, of, of Reconstruction studies of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, which sees Reconstruction through the prism of civil rights, uh, and to a lesser extent, the anti-war movement and, and women's rights. But basically, you have a, a greater emphasis on social history. Uh, the lives of ordinary people, um, more expansive de definitions of politics. So we're thinking of like, you know, Eric Foner and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and sort of some of the names we're familiar with there. Um, but I think particularly in, in popular culture, um, we have gotten away from sort of the Marxist uh, materialist uh, underpinnings that to me define some of the very best reconstruction studies um, and those are some of them that come out of the 1960s, but, but particularly those that come out of the 1930s. Um, we think about Du Bois' uh, Black Reconstruction in America mm -hmm. um, and Jim Allen's uh, Battle for Democracy, um, which both came out in the mid-1930s, which in some ways you know, still read as two of the best uh, histories of Reconstruction. And they have this um, you know, um, materialist shank to them um, and a sort of a, a Marxian uh, analysis. Um, and, uh, and I think that, 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 uh, a lot of sort of the more, at least in popular culture, the more sort of, um, liberal understandings of reconstruction as a, as a first civil rights movement are, are great. Um, but what gets lost in that is, is sort of the, the historical materialism that, that, um, that really is under, is necessary and not even just an emphasis on political economy. I'm talking about a, a real sort of understanding of, of, of the class structure, uh, of the South uh, mm -hmm. and and the, and the radical radical coalition as as understanding what Reconstruction was about and and why it was you know why it collapsed. Yeah, well, I mean, um, you know that, that that I think is is a perfect place to to leave off for right now, um, folks. I'm going to have the links below um, to some articles that Matt has written and Jackman along with his book. You all should definitely check it out. And uh, Matt, I really appreciate uh, you spending some time with us today, my friend. It was a great, David. Thanks for having me.